Ready to talk about medications for treating ADHD? If your clients are confused about what options are actually out there, I've got the answers. Hi, it's Brain Bites with me, Dr. B. I'm Jessica Bichkovsky, your friendly online psychiatrist. Let's dig in. Let's start with some ADHD stats. First of all, about 2.5% of adults have the diagnosis of ADHD, but prevalence is probably over 4%. Adult diagnosis of ADHD has more than doubled since 2007. The first line treatment, stimulants, which means medications with methylphenidate or amphetamine and dextroamphetamine. Based on multiple research studies, stimulants are effective with over 70 to 80% of adults with ADHD showing significant improvement with stimulants over placebo. It's important to know that these medications are all Schedule II controlled substances, which means they have a high risk for abuse. So the prescriber has to have a DEA license to prescribe them. This can put prescribers in a tricky position, partly because of the diagnostic challenges that I mentioned in previous videos, but also the risk of undertreatment and what comes along with that versus the risk of medicalizing normal variants and giving unnecessary meds, which are a limited resource since pharmacies run out of these meds all the time. It is common for college students to seek out ways to improve grades with or without ADHD, but stimulants usually have a negligible effect on grade. People can also feel the effects of these meds physically, which reinforces use. And most people like the effects of stimulants. For this group, based on research, good study habits are way more effective for improving grades than stimulants. But the stimulants may help with prioritizing studying over other activities. Let's break down the main pharmacological options. There are stimulants, like methylphenidate and amphetamine, dextroamphetamine, versus the non-stimulant medications, like noradrenergic medication, alpha-2 adrenergic agonists, and antidepressants. Ever wonder how stimulants work? They modulate dopamine and norepinephrine, which affects attention, focus, executive functioning, and impulse control. Stimulants can increase levels of dopamine by either blocking the dopamine transporters so they can't take it up back into the neuron, or they can increase the release of the dopamine directly from the neurons. And in some cases, these medications can inhibit the enzymes that break down dopamine. And higher dopamine means improved motivation, reward processing, focus, attention, and impulse control. So stimulants can also increase norepinephrine levels in a similar fashion. By blocking the norepinephrine transporter from pulling the norepi back into the neuron, or enhancing norepinephrine release from the neurons. Higher norepinephrine improves alertness, arousal, working memory, attention, focus, all the stuff we definitely want to see improved in ADHD. So what areas of the brain are most impacted by stimulants? Well, the right inferior frontal cortex for cognitive control and inhibition, and better function here means better impulse control and attention regulation. The prefrontal cortex activity normalizes because it's often underactive in ADHD, and that leads to improved planning, decision-making, and working memory. And finally, stimulants affect the striatum, where increased dopamine enhances motivation and reward processing, leading to improvements in task initiation and completion. Stimulants improve attention and focus, working memory for holding and working with information, processing speed and reaction times, and impulse control, helping to inhibit inappropriate responses. And they help people with ADHD get more stuff done. Tasks actually getting completed. In general, long-acting medication formulations are preferred because they're less likely to be misused and they provide better control of symptoms for almost the whole day, usually about eight to 14 hours. The short acting stimulants kick in in 30 to 60 minutes and last three to six hours. And with any stimulants, a person with ADHD can see positive effects immediately or at least within a few days. 
But stimulants also come with risks. There's potential addiction or misuse, and meds may be shared or sold. And these meds can also worsen other mental health issues by increasing anxiety, worsening insomnia and irritability, triggering mania, or even worsening psychosis. Common side effects of stimulants are appetite suppression, dry mouth, nausea, increased blood pressure and heart rate, arrhythmias, strokes, myocardial infarctions or heart attacks, and are generally not recommended in pregnancy due to potential harm to the fetus. But of course, we always have to compare the risks with the benefits, and many times it makes sense to stick with stimulants. So just briefly, I'd like to specifically talk about each type of stimulant, starting with methylphenidate, which primarily inhibits the reuptake of dopamine and norepinephrine. So it's blocking the transporter from bringing it back into the neuron. Methylphenidate has a weaker effect on actually releasing dopamine and norepi from the neurons. It has a little shorter duration of action, lasting about three to four hours for the immediate release formulations and eight to 12 for extended release. These medications are generally thought to have a lower risk of appetite suppression and insomnia and tend to have a smoother effect, so a gentler on and off. Usually methylphenidate is the first choice because of the slightly lower abuse potential and it's available in oral, immediate release, extended release, and a transdermal patch. This medication is not metabolized by the CYP450 system, which also means fewer drug-drug interactions. Common trade names are Ritalin and Conserva. So that leaves the amphetamine and dextroamphetamine formulations. These medications increase the release of dopamine and norepinephrine and may help more with depression because of the increase in dopamine release. They also inhibit the reuptake of dopamine and norepinephrine by the transporters, but to a lesser extent than methylphenidate. There's a longer duration of action with four to six hours for the immediate release versions and 12 to 14 hours of coverage for the extended release versions. In some studies, amphetamine and dextroamphetamine medications are more effective in reducing severity of adult ADHD symptoms. And then side effects include a much more pronounced appetite suppression and insomnia. People also tend to feel a kick when the medication becomes effective, which likely contributes to why it's thought to have higher abuse potential. There are different formulations here as well, such as the immediate release, the extended release, a mixed amphetamine salts, or even a prodrug that the body converts to dextroamphetamine. And these stimulants are metabolized by the CYP450 system in the liver, which means there are more potential drug-drug interactions than with methylphenidate. Commonly prescribed trade names are Adderall, Vyvanse, and there are two newer meds that were approved in 2021, Azstaris and Zelstrom, which is a transdermal patch. So stimulants can be great, but they aren't the right fit for everyone. But even non-stimulants have some side effects, like increased anxiety, hypertension, irritability, and sedation. So let's briefly talk about other medications used to treat ADHD in adults. Stratera, or adamoxetine, is a norepinephrine reuptake inhibitor that increases norepi levels in the prefrontal cortex and modulates noradrenergic transmission there. Like mentioned with the stimulants, Stratera inhibits the norepi transporter so it can't bring the norepinephrine back into the neuron, which helps raise the levels of norepinephrine. This is metabolized by CYP2D6, so the P450 system, and can potentially have drug-drug interactions. The most common side effects specific to Stratera are GI upset, increased heart rate, headaches, somnolence or feeling sleepy, dizziness, irritability, and mood swings. Veloxazine is a newer noradrenergic medication as well. Wellbutrin or bupropion is an antidepressant and an NDRI, increasing levels of norepinephrine and dopamine by blocking the transporters that bring these chemicals back into the neurons. This medication has immediate release, sustained release, and extended release and it helps with mood, ADHD, quitting smoking, and weight loss. 
Some side effects of Wellbutrin are increased anxiety, decreased appetite, increased heart rate and or blood pressure, and irritability. I have a whole video on Wellbutrin and why it's awesome. So you could check that out here. And finally, there are two alpha-2 adrenergic agonists that are also prescribed for ADHD in adults, although I generally see these used more often in kids. Guanfacine, which is known by the trade names of Intuniv or Tenex, and Clonidine or Capfe, which can be calming and help with hyperactivity. This class of medications binds to and activates selective alpha-2 adrenergic receptors in the prefrontal cortex, which modulates norepinephrine signaling, strengthening the prefrontal cortex network connections to regulate attention, emotion, and behavior. These medications don't work immediately and can take weeks to kick in due to the gradual strengthening of the prefrontal cortex networks. Common side effects are sedation, dizziness, low blood pressure, dry mouth, headache, decreased appetite, nausea, constipation, and these medications should be tapered because withdrawal can happen if they're stopped abruptly. These medications can interact with other medications, but they also play really well with stimulants and can be added to help broaden the symptom management. And they come in immediate or extended release formulations. Although there are some pretty good guidelines out there for how to prescribe these medications and a lot of different formulations and dosing, Prescribers can get pretty creative and precise with different dosing strategies. Medications might be layered, taken at different times, an extended release during the day and an immediate release in the afternoon, or you could take an immediate release right before a, a very important or long meeting. For adults with ADHD, it can make sense to have intentional medication breaks, like on weekends or vacations when responsibilities are lower. Breaks also help to reduce side effects like insomnia and appetite suppression with little negative effect on the annoying ADHD symptoms and also helps prevent medication tolerance. And a really big thing to remember is to always add non-pharmacological treatments. So psychoeducation, standing and stretching breaks, consistent schedules and routines, normalizing failure as growth identifying triggers for emotional reactivity, and building organizational and planning skills. I hope your brain is full of tasty medication goodness, no stimulants or side effects required. Be sure to grab more tasty tidbits at BrainBites with DrB.com. Enjoy!